All right, so today we'll be talking about uh, trees of Africa, continuing our unit where we're looking at different trees of the world. And so for context here, Africa is going to be 54 countries covering 11.7 million square miles. Uh, so it's the second largest continent behind Asia, uh, home to 1.1 billion people, so incredibly diverse. And in terms of topography, again, you've got vast areas near sea level, lots of large inland lakes, some of them even in rift valleys where the lakes are continuing to expand. Um, the largest lake is the second biggest lake, freshwater lake on the planet, um, only behind Lake Superior up near Michigan here. Um, and then the high point is Kilimanjaro at almost 20,000 feet of elevation. And so the soils are going to be really diverse. Again, at that continental scale, you have pretty much all 12 soil orders. Um, what you are missing here, uh, you may not have very many gelosols, those would be confined to higher elevations. Uh, but you'll notice lots of aridosols and entosols in the Sahara Desert. And then in the, the Congo rainforest, you've got a, a lot of those oxisols we saw in the Amazon rainforest. So there's going to be some similarities there. The climate, again, is going to shape a lot of the range maps that we see. And so the Sahara has high temperatures and very low precipitation. No surprise. Um, we've got high temperatures, but a lot of precipitation for the, the basin in the Congo there. And then we're going to learn a lot of trees that have sort of a South African distribution. So you can see it'll be temperate climates, but there are areas with relatively low rainfall. So we're going to see a lot of species growing in forests that may look like parts of central Texas, where they are relatively water limited, and so that's dictating tree density and the total heights that these trees are reaching. And so here's a very broad sort of cover type map of Africa. You can see this is just the Google Earth image. You can see where trees are not in the Sahara and where trees are. There are other deserts in parts of South Africa, the Horn of Africa there. And it breaks down into different rainforests, different deciduous temperate forests. Um, and then you even end up with Mediterranean climates. Um, actually in parts of South Africa, uh, as well as along the Mediterranean. And so let's start uh, right away. So we covered acacias when we talked about trees of Australia. Uh, under the angiosperm phylogeny group's third revision, many of what were acacias in Africa have actually been recategorized into the Bacchelia genes. So these will look very similar to the wattles, the acacias we learned in Australia, and they used to think that they were more closely related than they do today. Um, so here's our first one, umbrella thorn acacia, of ACE Bacchelia tortillus. You'll notice that range map on the, the right there probably isn't the most accurate since it does include pretty much the whole Sahara Desert. So a little more difficult to get range maps for some of these species. But if you look at the form, we can see that it's a relatively short tree, 20 or 30 feet tall, with a wide, relatively flat topped crown. There's one famous umbrella thorn acacia called the Tree of Tener. Um, and you see the map right there with the, the country of Niger. And you see that little blue, you know, Google place marker I put on it. That Google place marker is not just marking the center of the country there. That's marking the location of this one tree. So check out that Google Earth image and look at the, just the colors of the land around it. It's the only tree for 250 miles. Uh, so it's the most remote tree on the planet. And so here's what the, the tree of Tener looks like, just completely out in the middle of nowhere. So how does a tree get 250 miles away from anything? Well, basically, the, the desert has expanded as climates have changed over time, and there once would have been a forest, uh, or at least a woodland, of umbrella thorn acacias, and this is the last one left hanging on. And so it's way out there by itself now. Because umbrella thorn acacia can handle such harsh environments, it's often used in programs where they try to green the desert or prevent deserts from expanding. So that is one use for this species. 
But if you look at it, it's kind of interesting. If that's the only tree within 250 miles and you dig a well and you find tree roots, guess which tree it came from? <laughs> um, so they dug a 40 meter well in the, in the vicinity. So 40 meters, we're looking at about 130 feet. Lo and behold, tree roots. And so that's how it's surviving there. It's rooted down. It didn't look very impressive above ground, but it's, it's rooted down really far. Now I've been, I've been speaking about this tree in the present tense. I, I didn't want to spoil the sad surprise here. It got hit by a drunk Libyan truck driver in the seventies and knocked down. So it doesn't exist anymore. So he could have gone here, he could have gone there, but he went right in the middle. So um, only tree for 250 miles and it still got hit. So now they have this metal sort of memorial to the tree out there, but it no longer exists. It might've died anyway, if he hadn't done it. Okay, so let's look at a few more of these uh, acacia-like trees, the Bacchelias, because they're pretty diverse, uh, pretty important ecologically. This one's fever tree, Fabaceae Bacchelia xanthophloia. A little more accurate range map probably, showing a Southeast African distribution. And when we look at fever tree, they have found that it seems to be in decline. And so they've done a lot of studies on a lot of these different Bacchelia trees in Africa. And they have herbivores that, you know, we don't really think about here in North America. They have giraffes, they have elephants. So they have some very large herbivores. So, you know, good luck getting an elephant not to knock down a tree, let alone not to defoliate it. And so they notice these trees are in decline. Well, the obvious thing is, well, maybe they're being overgrazed by these large herbivores. And so they started looking into it and they actually put up fencing studies to exclude giraffes and elephants and other animals. And the trees did just as poorly. And so it didn't seem like herbivory was the main problem. They started looking into it a little bit more and the climate had been growing slightly drier, which accumulates salts in the soils. So maybe that played a little bit of a role, but really what they kind of figured out is a common forest management practice throughout the world they started looking at the trees and understanding the silvics. And it turns out these are relatively short lived trees. And these forests that were in decline were even aged. So they had a bunch of old trees that were senescing and dying when they normally do. So it wasn't any big mystery. They just needed to find a way to get them regenerating well. Um, and that, that would sort of solve their problem. Of course, if you have a lot of herbivores, it's hard to get seedlings to establish and do well. So sometimes you need fencing treatments to exclude the herbivores until the seedlings can get big enough and then you remove those fencing treatments. Now, why is it called fever tree? Okay, so we, we talked about quinine last class and how that's used to cure malaria. And of course it comes from the tree in South America. Well, some European explorers first started exploring Africa. They started getting malaria and they had no idea what was going on. They're just getting sick. They don't know what's causing it. And they seem to get sick more in swampy areas. And these trees are growing on wetter sites in an area with a relatively arid climate. And so they're like, we're getting sick and these trees are always there. So they think for a while that this tree is causing their symptoms, which has led for this English common name of fever tree to stick with it in the English speaking world. But of course, then they figured out, no, uh, we're in wet areas. It's the mosquitoes uh, that are the vector for this disease. So it's not the tree. Okay, I've got one more acacia here for you, Bacchelia drapana, oh, sorry, drapanolobium. And you can see the distribution there, the Horn of Africa and Eastern Africa. And with uh, this tree, its common name is whistling thorn. And so if you're wandering around in this area at night and the breeze picks up, you'll kind of hear a sort of dull whistle, you know, sort of noise like if you're blowing on a beer bottle or a, a can or something. And it's, it's really kind of eerie. And you go to start figuring out what's going on there. And it turns out that this Bacchelia tree has all these weird bulbous things with thorns sticking out of them, but they have holes in them. And the wind is blowing across the holes of these weird bulbous things making a whistling noise. Well, one line of thinking is that whistling noise is there to warn herbivores. It's a, a form of self-defense. So again, this is a region with herbivores like giraffes and elephants. And so giraffes have prehensile tongues. They'll strip foliage clean off a tree and obviously they can reach it up high. 
Elephants don't really care about thorns. They'll go right through that. But when you get into the thorns on this whistling thorn tree, the thorns may bug them a little, but what really bugs them within these weird hollow things, outstorm a bunch of ants that start biting. Them. So these, it turns out, are actually nectaries that the trees form with the intent that they will form a mutualism with a bunch of different biting ant species. And so they use some of their photosynthate to form nectar that feeds the ants. And then the ants then help defend the tree against herbivores. And it's even more complex than that. There are multiple species of ants. And so these trees, if they touch crowns with another whistling thorn, the ants will start fighting each other and until one of them wins out. And so they'll actually start nipping off buds and they'll start nipping off climbing vines so that you, know, you don't have access for other ants to get into the tree that they're defending. Um, the tree is giving them sugar, but it's not giving them proteins or fats. So that means they go out and they kill other insects on this tree in order to meet that need as part of their diet, which means if you have beetles that are boring into these trees, well, the ants will get those too. And so they're serving as a defense, not just against herbivores, but against other insects. They're helping the tree compete with neighbors. They're doing all sorts of different things up in these trees. Well, they've done some interesting studies with these where what they've done is they've put up fences and they've excluded the large herbivores. And what they tend to find is when they exclude the large herbivores, the trees are like, eh, I don't need these ants. So they stop allocating as much to nectar. Well, then the ants aren't getting nectar from the tree, so they say, eh, I don't need the tree. They start cultivating aphids that'll produce a honeydew that they can get as the aphids bore into the tree. And the, they sometimes have species of ants that rely on the nectaries less that come in, but those ants are less fierce defenders. And so it'll shift the composition of the communities and the trees actually start declining because the ants be, aren't being as beneficial towards them. They're getting attacked by beetles and other insects, aphids as well. And so what they kind of find each of these CS, CM, CN, those are different species of ants that are found up in these nectaries. And once they lose herbivores, you get fewer nectaries on the trees. That's what this graph is showing. And over there, you have fewer of the swollen thorn. And so they actually kind of need the herbivores. The herbivores picking at the trees a little bit forces them to reallocate to defend themselves. And that helps against more than just the herbivores. So it's a really complex ecology with these whistling thorn, thorn trees. Okay, next up we have a mopang tree, sometimes it goes by mopani, Fubaceae colophospermum mopan. Um, and when you look at this tree, we got a pretty good range map here. And so this is gonna be an area much like parts of central Texas that doesn't get much rainfall. So it naturally forms these open woodlands. You know, these trees may be 30, 40 feet tall. Um, when these woodlands get real nice, sometimes they'll call them cathedral mopang. Uh, anyone watch uh, that show Naked and Afraid, where they send all the survivalists out naked? Well, they were in Africa for the latest season, and I don't know exactly where they were in Africa, but it was somewhere in that yellow shaded area. Because if you look behind them, you saw a whole bunch of mopang. And so it's real easy to identify because it's also called the butterfly tree. It has these bifoliate leaves. So the leaves look like the two wings on a butterfly. So this is one compound leaf here with two leaflets. So they're super easy to identify. It has some other common names to it as well. Balsam tree or turpentine tree. These leaves are flecked with little glands. And if you crush them up and smell them, they smell real turpentine, kind of like our sweet gum does here. And so all those chemicals that are producing in the leaves for most species discourages herbivory. Many insects and herbivores will leave this alone because it's just this foul, nasty tasting leaf um, and it can be toxic to them. Many, but not all. Uh, this carries over to the wood where the wood is very rotten termite resistant. And so they've used the wood for a long time uh, to build housing, you know, more primitive housing where you're worried about you know, cabins, things like that. You're worried about the wood decomposing, but it's been used historically to prop up mine shafts, all sorts of uses where you're worried about termites getting into the wood. So it's very termite resistant. And so this is what the wood looks like. It's a really beautiful wood, very rot resistant. 
Um, they have been using it lately in woodwind instruments like clarinets. Uh, traditionally, those would have been made of a different species, African blackwood. But as with many of these things, uh, those trees are being over harvested. And so they've started going to Mopar. Apparently it works pretty well, not much shape, easy to machine, sort of the right properties. Now I said most insects wouldn't eat the leaves, but some do, okay? So there's this moth that'll feed on Mopane. And this moth forms these huge caterpillars. I guess it's the other way around, right? The caterpillar forms the moth, but these things will be bigger than your middle finger, absolutely massive. And they will come into this area by the millions, the billions. And so people will harvest these mopane worms and the moth. Uh, you'll take them and you squeeze all the plant goo out of them, out one end or the other. Um, and then you can take them, you can sun dry them and eat them raw, kind of like weird little chips. You can boil them up in stews, but apparently they're a major source of protein for people in this region. Uh, so the trees serving as all sorts of products, but it also brings in insects which are used for food. Okay, so kind of shifting gears a little, moving out of the Fabaceae. This next tree is called frankincense, which most people have probably heard of, right? So this is the frankincense you've heard of. Uh, it's Bursaraceae boswellia sacra, is the species we'll be looking at, but there's a number of different species. And I could have put this in a few different lectures. So here we have Boswellia papyrifera growing in Ethiopia, um, parts of what were the Sudan. Uh, we're looking at Boswellia sacra, which is found in Yemen, Oman, um, and in parts of Somalia, right there on the Horn of Africa. And then you get Boswellia serrata over here in India. So we could have talked about this in trees of Asia as well. So looking at Boswellia sacra, it's kind of a small tree. It'll be, you know, five, six feet tall but it kind of forms this upside down triangle look most of the time. And so when you start looking at it, it's got leaves that are gonna be pinnately compound. They'll kind of remind us of our sumacs that we're gonna learn uh, probably week 10 in lab. But what everyone knows about frankincense is that you wound the trunk and it will start exuding resins mixed with gums and they're extremely fragrant. And so that has made this, you know, one of the most valuable trees out there historically. And again, if we flip back to the range map, it doesn't have a really broad range. And so this tree is called frankincense. Uh, this comes from the French, basically meaning, you know, good smelling. And then if you look at the word perfume, that basically means from smoke. It's talking about this tree. Uh, so you would burn it use the smoke and it would make incense, a good smelling smoke. And so uh, the Nabataean the, the uh, people, it was a, an Arab culture, they traded this thing for, for thousands of years. They hit their peak between 300 BCE and 200 CE uh, before they were basically absorbed into the Roman Empire. But they had this whole incense trading route all over this region. Uh, and so at the point when we, you know, have the story of the three wise men bringing frankincense, myrrh, and gold uh, to Jesus, the frankincense was worth more than the gold. And so it, it was really rare. Even a thousand years before that, the Egyptians were using this to embalm their dead. And it got so expensive to go through all this trade process to get it from where it was found down here um, over into Egypt, closer to the mouth of the Nile. Uh, some of the Egyptian rulers would go out and get it and send all sorts of people to collect it, bring them back, try and plant them, and they never got it to work out. They didn't do well uh, there by the Nile. So they had to keep this elaborate trade route going, and the trade route ended up stacking up to the point all these little diamonds are these different trading colonies. They had armed fortresses built along the trading routes. So it would be like if we had a trading route now that was taking around gold or platinum or some precious metal, but it's just this goop coming out of a tree. So kind of a weird thing to think about. Um, and so some modern day religions, Catholics, Greek Orthodox, frankincense is one of the plants that they will use in the incense that they're still burning today. And so you, you may have smelled this at some point. Okay, next up we have the Boabab, Malvaceae, Adansonia, Grandidittery. 
There are about eight species of boobabs. We already learned Australian boobab. Six of them are endemic to Madagascar. This is the largest of the six. So this is the impressive one. If you Google cool trees in Africa, this always comes up top five, right? And so it's got these huge swollen trunks. You have the person in the foreground here for scale, but it's got these huge swollen trunks without much canopy on them. So they're really set up to absorb water when it rains, and hang on to that water by storing it in the trunk as it swells. So water storage. Now here's Madagascar for context. It's this large island off the southeastern uh, coast of Australia. And what this is, this is a map of Madagascar and it's showing you all the different agricultural commodities that are produced there. And so there's a major conservation crisis ongoing in Madagascar. Well, they have a lot of endemic species, but many of those populations are either extinct, uh, threatened, or endangered. And that's happening for good reason. Uh, there's a lot of people on the island. The economy's not the best. And so they're basically just trying to survive through subsistence agriculture. And uh, in doing that, you know, there, there's environmental consequences. But uh, there's a lot of conservation efforts going on here now. And a lot of them are focused more and more on how do they help the people? Because if they help the people first, then that'll enable them to conserve uh, the wildlife, the plants, the natural resources. You know? uh, it turns out that this boobab actually flowers right at dusk. It flowers at night and it releases a big old, you know, tuft of pollen at night. And it's doing that because it's pollinated by this fork mark lemur. And so it's actually pollinated by a nocturnal animal. And so the lemurs will go around, they'll get the pollen on them, going after the nectar, they'll get into the other flowers, um, and they'll be what spreads the pollen. It's going to release a relatively large fruit, pretty heavy seeded, and, and really, you know, it looks like it's set up to be dispersed by wildlife, but none of these lemurs or other animals found in Mas Madagascar today seem big enough to disperse these seeds. And so it's mostly dispersed by water today. Um, the thoughts are that maybe it used to be dispersed by wildlife, but it's one of the species that may have gone extinct that was primarily uh, there dispersing it. So, so there's our only lemur pollinated tree all semester. Okay, uh, next up we have sausage tree. You can see why it's named sausage tree. If you came up on something like this in our part of the world, you might think, oh, someone's carrying sausage up in a tree. Uh, probably venison, right? So it looks like there are sausages hanging on this tree. Those fruits can be two feet long and weigh 15 pounds. So these are not small, these are not inconspicuous, they're huge. And so the trees out in the middle of nowhere, all those weird fruits hung up in it. Same story as what we've been seeing. I don't have a range map for you, but this is growing out in a, in a pretty dry, sort of very, very open woodland. It's an easy tree to identify. Well, here's a range map for you, but not the most accurate. It's pretty easy to identify. It's got pinnately compound leaves, odd pinnately compound with a terminal leaflet. And it's going to have between about 11 uh, to maybe seven leaflets. But if you look at the leaflets, they're real shiny green. It's like if you had a compound leaf made out of southern magnolia leaves. So it's, it's a really distinct looking leaf. To the top right here, you can see the flower. So if you're gonna have a fruit like what we just saw, you probably got a pretty substantial flower. Now these flowers, you know, they're actually pretty smart. So when you look at the fruits hanging on the tree, if each of these is 15 pounds, you probably don't want too many of them on one branch, you'll break the branch off. So often out on a branch, when the first flower is pollinated, that'll trigger all the other flowers to abort so that you don't overload the branch, you don't weigh it down too much and, and end up breaking limbs with this kind of ridiculous fruit. There's more on the flowers real showy and here's half a fruit in a person's hand, giving you a little better scale on this. So now if you uh, Google image search, uh, or not image search, but if you Google Kigelia Africana sausage tree, it's used medicinally for a lot of different stuff. And this isn't FDA approved medicine. This is more, you know, herbal supplement style medicine. Uh, the closest thing that was appropriate for classroom I could show you is this cellulite firming cream. But 
it's used to firm all sorts of stuff. So lots of people extracting stuff from sausage tree for lots of different purposes. Next up, we've got the quiver tree. That you all wish we had this family on some of our quiz trees, right? The Xanthoroaceae. So that, that's quite the family name. But if you're familiar with aloe, if you have an aloe plant in your dorm room, aloe dichotoma. There you go. So this is our one example of an aloe plant we'll look at this semester. Now it's called quiver tree. Uh, the indigenous sand people would take the limbs off this, hollow it out, and make quivers for their arrows for archery. And so that's a reference to its historic use. Uh, there are a number of different species of aloe in the Xanthoroaceae. Uh, we're just going over aloe dichotoma, which you see is here, native to southwestern Africa in a pretty broad range. But you can see there's aloe palansi, aloe ramosaissimum, aloe barbare, and aloe tonganese, and then aloe uh, ethanins further north. So you have about half a dozen species in this family and genus. These trees, we're used to thinking of them, you know, aloe that we get in a pot around here. We're used to thinking of them as these small little plants where you're breaking the leaves off, right? We're not used to seeing them as an actual, you know, something out in the wild. But they get these pretty stout trunks. The whole thing will only be like 10 feet tall. But this one's aloe dichotoma. So what you're seeing is this trunk splits in half, then it splits in half. See how it keeps splitting in half? That's what gives it this cool round canopy that you see there. So we're gonna see that in another tree here again in just a moment. So that's a dichotomous branching pattern. Our elms that we're learning here in East Texas, our elms often have a dichotomous branching pattern. So there's another look at the tree and you know, these things are real easy to identify from pretty far away. Just a really obvious distinct form. Here's what they look like potted that may look more familiar to you. And these are the leaves where you take them, you break them off, you squeeze um, the moisture out of them, and it's real thick and viscous. And it's used in all sorts of lotions, burn creams. Um, it helps heal skin, especially from burns. So people often use aloe after getting like a bad sunburn. For and then it's in the, the base, or sorry, the xanthoro AC. It's got real showy yellow flowers. Okay, next up we have leadwood. It's in the Combretaceae, Combretum in Verbe. And it has a distribution that's honestly pretty similar to what we saw in Mopane. So you're probably gonna find leadwood mixed in with these same open woodlands uh, where you're finding the Mopane. Uh, when we look at the leaves on it, they are kind of like, you know, real dry site willow oak leaves if you wanna think about it that way. Um, where it's, you know, just a long linear to elliptical leaf, entire margins, a few tip. It's going to have some arrows on it, so we can see the some arrows here, the winged seeds there. And then it's going to have pretty rough bark, kind of analogous to our live oak, maybe. That's what you're looking for morphologically. And then I threw this one in there. Uh, there's a lot of really cool trees that are harvested in Africa and used commercially throughout the world. This one, I mean, Leadwood's the name, right? This is the world's sixth densest wood. So in terms of pounds per cubic feet, here's much how much a cubic foot of water would weigh. A cubic foot of water is gonna weigh 62.3 pounds. A cubic foot of this wood weighs 75.8 pounds. You can throw this wood in water and it's literally gonna sink like most metals do. So it's got a very dense wood. Okay, next up we have the marula tree. We already know the Anacardiaceae family. That's the cashew family that sumac and poison ivy are in. And this is Sclerocaria birria. Sclerocaria birria. Caria, we know that on our hickories, so that's referring to the nut. Sclero is just referring to how hard the nut is, basically. So this has a hard nut. That range map is showing you South Africa. Um, and so you can see. This is just gonna be found uh, down at the southern extents of the African continent. Same story to what we've been seeing, right? You've got these areas with low rainfall. So it's yet another small statured tree in an open, open woodland. Okay, so uh, this marula tree is known primarily for its fruit, 
Um, it has kind of this apple-like golden fruit that you can see photos of in the upper right there. Uh, but that fruit is used in popular liqueurs like this Amarula, Marula fruit liqueur. And you'll notice the picture of the elephant on it. The elephants are used in branding these products. And that comes uh, from, I guess, the uh, story that's been passed down where people have seen elephants out munching on these fruits. Well, again, this is a pretty hot area. So if you have reasonable high temperatures and a source of sugar, you're gonna get some organism chewing up that sugar. And if it's a yeast, the byproduct's gonna be carbon dioxide and alcohol. And so these fruits are naturally fermenting out on the trees. And so the story goes that the elephants are chomping down all these marula fruits. And then, you know, you got a drunk elephant, it's gonna be pretty belligerent, stumbling around, breaking stuff. And so they've used it for branding on this marula liqueur. Well, some wildlife biologists looked into this and kind of, you know, were a little skeptical. So they, they did some back of the envelope calculations. And apparently, you know, an elephant's pretty big. You've got to booze it up pretty good before it gets good and drunk. And apparently these things, it would have to eat just an absurd amount of them to actually get a buzz going. So it turns out it's not the drunken Dumbo situation. The elephants aren't actually getting drunk on these. Some smaller animals, smaller baboons or something eating them, they might be getting a little tipsy on them, but Probably not the elephants, but the story is interesting. So I guess it works for brand. Okay, next up we have sycamore fig. So again, we've talked about figs a few times. There's 750 fig species in the world. And we learned about the strangler fig in Australia. Um, this is the sycamore fig. And you can see I've spelled sycamore with an O and not an A. You'll see this spelled either way. I, I picked the spelling with an O just to make the distinction that this has nothing to do with the American sycamore we've learned in lab. So this is Moraceae ficus sycamorus, and that, that scientific specific epithet there is also spelled with the O. There are people right here for scale. So this tree gets even wider than our live oaks usually do. So it's a really impressive tree. That, that's a massive tree, much bigger than a lot of the species we've been looking at thus far. Um, when you look at sycamore fig, it may be called sycamore because the leaves are vaguely sycamore-like. I, I don't personally see it, but um, it's got the fruit on it, the sweet fig that people like to eat. And then it's got a pretty broad distribution in Africa, including what river do we have right here? Yes, yeah, so that's the Nile River in Egypt. So this, this has been growing along the Nile River uh, for quite a long time. And so this is uh, believed to be the tree that the ancient Egyptians thought of as the tree of life. So you can find some of their artwork today where people have looked at this and kind of figured a sycamore fig is the closest thing uh, that this depiction of a tree could actually be. And they've actually looked at some of the wood uh, that some of these uh, sarcophagus are made out of. And it turns out they were made out of sycamore. Fig. And so the ancient Egyptians would have believed this to be the tree of life. It's providing wood, it's providing fruit. So it's about as much as a tree can do. Okay, next up we've got the dragon blood tree, Asparagaceae dracenia simbari. This also has the dichotomous branching pattern that we saw on aloe. And so you can see the trunk splits in half, splits in half, splits in half. And it gives them a similar, very interesting flat top form. And it's doing that for a specific reason. So if we look at the range map from this mature dragon blood tree, it's found on this island, Socotra, that's actually part of Yemen. And so it's right out here in the middle off the Horn of Africa, similar range uh, we talked about with frankincense, but it's a pretty dry island. Yet you get fog blowing over it, you get moisture blowing over it. So the idea is you get clouds moving three, moving through, and this canopy acts as a fog collector. So moisture accumulates on it. And where does every branch lead? Right down into the middle, right down the trunk, and right down to the roots. So the crown is actually structured to help it collect moisture in a pretty dry environment. Look, look around there. I mean, it's just a pile of rocks that's growing out. There's not a lot of water to it. Here's the young trees. They have more of a palm-like look. And the Asparagaceae is one of our monocot families. Um, so this is one of the few monocots we'll talk about this semester. We'll cover another one here in this lecture. But why is it called dragon's blood tree? Uh, there's a few reasons. 
One, it gets this uh, red resin it exudes that can be dried down into these slabs that appear like dried blood. And so this has been used for thousands of years in the trade. We already saw how they have all these different trade networks in this region. And so on the island of Socotra, you have Arabian traders meeting with African traders, meeting with traders from India, and they'd all be exchanging different products. Um, and so, you know, they, they brought this back to India as a red dye. And I guess they, you know, came up with a legend where there was this huge battle between different deities. One was an elephant, one was a dragon on this island in Socotra. And the dragon, you know, was injured, and that's where this was coming from. So that's where they came up with the name Dragon's Blood. And you can see it even fits in here, Dracenia, it's referring to a dragon in Latin. So Dracenia cymbaris. So this was another tree that exudes some resin that became pretty commercially important, um, at least for a time within this region. Okay, next up we have the Coco de Mer. That's in the Ericaceae family, the palm family. And this is one of the few palms we'll go over. It's L Lodoicea maldivica. Now, Maldivica is referring to some islands, the Maldives, and it's actually found here within the Seychelles. Um, and it, there's only about 2,000 of these out there. And they're on these two islands, Praslin Island and Curias, which is even small. So it's sort of this ideal sort of tropical paradise looking area um, north of Madagascar for context there. So not found in many places, people discovered this tree long before they even knew like where these islands were. And so they discovered the tree because this has the largest seed in the world. The seeds can weigh 65 pounds. This tree is also dioecious. Uh, so the male flower will be three feet long. It's as long as your arm, okay? So it's got one of the largest flowers. It is the largest catkin in the world. It's got the largest seed in the world. And as you look at these things, it doesn't just look like a coconut. It's got this split in the middle and it looks like that. So imagine if you're a sailor out in the 1700s and this floats up to your ship, what are people gonna start cracking jokes about? This has very been called butt nut, all sorts of different things, uh, but they, they didn't know where this was coming from. So coco de mer means coconut of the sea. They thought it was coming off the bottom of the ocean somewhere. So they thought this is some part of a mermaid floating up or something, they had no idea. These things got so rare and valuable that they were selling in England in the 1750s for $100,000. Um, and I found this one on eBay for $5,000. Um, they're illegal to harvest there now, so they're still pretty rare. But some of these you know, were collected you know, 100 or more years ago. So they're both rare and old. So, you know, Pretty interesting if you envision yourself being on this ship and discovering this thing for the first time and not having any clue what it is. So there's the world's largest sea. Now, this is an example of island gigantism, where basically seeds falling on the ground under the mother tree, they get outcompeted by the mother tree. And so eventually these trees got into an arms race where they develop bigger and bigger and bigger seeds. But what kind of animal do you think disperses a 65 pound palm seed? Nothing, right? There's nothing on this island near big enough to carry that around. So the seed actually has to do its own dispersal. This thing will fall underneath the mother tree. The mother tree's got a good root system. If it's gonna hold up 65 pound seeds, it better. And then what this thing does is it grows a shoot out and the shoot comes out from right here in the split. And that shoot comes out and it roots into the ground. It'll root about six inches deep. Then it sends off a runner that grows underground about 15 feet away. And at the end of that, that's where your new tree grows up. So this seed is so big, it can grow underground for like 15 feet before going above ground and putting leaves on because it's got a ton of sugar, nutrients, everything it needs stored right within that seed. So hopefully then it's not competing with the mother tree. And again, they put on a very sturdy root system this area can get hit with pretty high winds out there on an island and very heavy seas. Okay, so next up we have the Nera plant, Cucurbitaceae acanthosicios foridus. And so this is woody, but it's not really tree-like. And uh, this will be found out in the Namib Desert. And it's, you know, just sand like this, nothing but sand. 
Those uh, prickles on it are pretty nasty, which is why it gets hortus right there as the specific epithet. Uh, but I first saw this thing on TV. I was watching this show that they don't air anymore called Dude, You're Screwed. Uh, but they would take these survivalists and they would, you know, fake kidnap them. And then three or four other survivalists would drop them off in some really difficult location to, to survive in. And they would give them just ridiculous items. Uh, they dropped one guy off way up in the middle of nowhere in Scandinavia and gave him like a huge stuffed teddy bear and a Viking shield. Uh, but they dropped this poor guy out in the Namib desert uh, and they put him in a full business suit. So not exactly what you would want out there and gave him very little. So he was wandering around there for a while, did okay. But he eventually came upon some of this Nara plant. He was pretty thirsty. So he broke one of the fruits off and then drank it and then just starts puking everywhere. So maybe from dehydration, I don't know how toxic it is. Uh, but there's actually uh, research showing that uh, some people in this region for over 8,000 years have been making flour out of this and using it uh, in their diet. So it has been a food plant in an area where, you know, that, that's a pretty tough place to survive, right? There's not much out there. Very, very water limited. Okay. So within that same region here in Namibia, uh, you'll find the jackalberry. And it would probably be easier to call this Namibian persimmon, right? Or African persimmon. It's Evanaceae diospyros mispilliformis. So it is closer, closely related to the persimmon that we've learned in lab. And if you look at the tree, you know, you could probably tell that from the leaves. Very, very similar leaves. Very similar fruit to it as well. And then the bark, the bark's not going to be as helpful. Um, here you can see it on a Namibian stamp. And you'll notice the persimmon right here, but right there in the background, those are giant termite mounds. So really big termite mounds. So there's a, cute, a cool mutualism between this tree and the termites. And at first, when you think about trees and termites, it doesn't sound like they should work well together, right? Since termites often eat wood, trees are made of wood, not ideal. But what happens if you look at that depiction in the stamp, the termites need some shade, a tree can provide that. And these trees are rooting into pretty dry regions. And so if you go to a drier region, often the calcium doesn't get leached out with rainfall in the soil and can form pretty hard, even concrete-like layers in the soil. Soils can calcify, uh, form bradypans, all sorts of other soil layers like that. But the tree can root into the soil that's been cultivated by the termites. So the termites provide the tree with a good rooting environment. And the tree provides the termites with some shade and they leave it alone and they, they don't kill it. So interesting mutualism. Okay, so here's our last tree in Africa. And you've seen in a lot of the other continents, I've tried to show you the biggest trees, the oldest trees, the largest trees, because those are always interesting. Well, I looked up the tallest tree in Africa and it turns out it's a eucalyptus, uh, which is from Australia. So um, Africa is not really known for its incredibly tall trees. So this is in the Lopopo province of South Africa, the country. And uh, it's actually a eucalyptus saligna, a Sydney blue gum uh, that was planted in 1906 and is now 262 feet tall. And so it's actually the world's tallest planted tree. So that tree is sitting here at about 80 meters in height. Right nearby it are a couple pine trees that are 50 meters tall. And the pine trees they planted there are Pinus ocarpa, um, which is from Mexico and the Caribbean. And so they brought trees from all over the world to plant here in South Africa. And some of them do really, really well. Uh, South Africa has a, a major forest products industry. And a lot of it is driven by radiata pine from California, loblolly pine from here. Uh, eucalyptus from Australia. So they don't have a lot of native species that they're growing for timber, but they have a lot of exotics they brought in and then they bred them so that they work well in these climates and grow really well. So, so any questions on the trees of Africa?